Good day. Welcome to OnDrive, a program which we will be unearthing all of our heroes. We'll speak into the top sports administrators around the cricketing world, and we'll also be speaking to the legends of the game, both on the men, the women, and the youths. It also now means that we're creating a new platform for cricket throughout the entire world, and we're blessed on this special on-drive program to have our first guest in the CEO of Cricket West Indies, Johnny Grave. Johnny, my co-host is Calvin Blankendell from Bermuda, and I'm Vernon Springer, broadcasting live from Antigua Barbuda and the Leeward Islands, and we're pleased to have you speaking to us in terms of West Indies cricket. I know it's been a challenge, but I want to just ask you one simple question. Johnny, why the West Indies, and why did you come to Cricket West Indies? Well, firstly, let me uh, thank you both for inviting me onto your show and congratulations on, uh, on getting this new platform out there to, to engage and entertain, hopefully, cricket fans. Yeah, I've been in the role now uh, just over four and a half years, so it seems like a, a long time ago I made the decision to uh, move over to live in Antigua and Barbuda and take up the role as Chief Exec of Cricket West Indies. I'd um, been working in cricket um, for... Um, about 18 years before I made the move here, um, working at Surrey County Cricket Club, who uh, are based at the Oval Cricket Ground in London, and also the the Players Union in the UK, the Professional Cricketers Association. So uh, always in commercial roles and media and PR roles and marketing roles. But um, yeah, now made the move, as I said, back in 2017 to be Chief Exec of, uh, of Cricket West Indies. What ignited you to come to the Caribbean? I think the challenge more than anything else was to, uh, you know, to try and modernise and professionalise West Indies cricket on and off the field. And I think um, knowing that Jimmy Adams, the director of cricket, was joining at the same time. And at that point, the head coach, Stuart Law, uh, both both of whom I knew from my time within English cricket, um, it seemed like a good opportunity for the three of us to come on board to join the organisation, which had ambitions um, as I said, both on and off the field, and to uh, to try and um, you know, bring that experience that I had in in the UK um, to try and bring that to the Caribbean. So yeah, it was uh, it was a unique opportunity. Obviously, these chief exec roles in cricket don't come up very often, and uh, when they do, and when you've gone through the long recruitment process and they've offered you the job, you know, it's uh, it wasn't a very difficult decision to um, to accept it. What are the challenges, Johnny? coming from England to the Caribbean? What are some of the challenges that, that you're facing? Well, clearly resources, you know, there's the significantly less financial resources in the Caribbean compared to English cricket. Obviously, you're dealing with much smaller populations and therefore, by default, you know, smaller public and private sectors uh, to support the cricket. And clearly, the Caribbean has the unique challenges of having so many countries spread across um, the Caribbean from Guyana in the south all the way through to Jamaica in the north and uh, and that sort of logistics and travel that's not only very expensive but it's also very inconsistent and um and always changing so um yeah i would say that's the um the biggest sort of difference between english cricket and caribbean cricket and particularly the fact that in the uk uh, as many as many other boards have they have a a, a big host broadcaster so the domestic tv company is is really financing the entire game and that's the same across the cricketing world but here in the caribbean that's not the case so that's that's one of the unique challenges uh that, that west indies cricket faces now explain to us about the the structure and when i say the structure i know that you are the ceo of cricket west indies but what happens operational in terms of your office and the directors well, not dissimilar to any other board of, 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 of the four members. We have uh, six territorial boards. Um, obviously, in the case of India, they have many, many more member states, and there's obviously 18 counties in the UK. But we have six territorial boards who are, who are our shareholders. They're our shareholder members. Um, and we're governed by a board of directors that made up of predominantly representatives from those territorial boards, but with a number of independent directors as well that make up the board of directors. Um, the the six shareholder members are Guyana, uh, Trinidad, Barbados, Jamaica, 
and then the Leeward Islands and Windward Islands, which are made up of the collection of smaller islands within those two uh, unique territories. And the office operational um, will involve like director of cricket and wells. Yeah, so we're headquarters in Antigua and Barbuda. We've been here for many years now. Um, previously, several decades ago, we were based in Barbados, but for many, many years, we're, we've been based here in Antigua. Um, yeah, we have a senior management team that, that obviously look after those key um, areas and departments within the organization. So we have an executive office and administration department. We have a commercial marketing and communications department. We have a cricket department. Um, and obviously a financial department. So um, Jimmy Adams leads the cricket department, which uh, is made up of uh, an operations team who deal with all the tours and tournaments throughout the region, uh, a high performance team that look after those elite teams in the men's and women's and boys and girls sections, um, which includes sports science and medicine. Um, and then, um, you know, we've got a grassroots and participation team as well that look after the non-professional side of the game, trying to encourage uh, and promote um, cricket at all levels, particularly the schools, primary and secondary schools, as well as support the clubs within those territories. So uh, that's the kind of structure that we have here at Cricket West Indies. Well, Johnny, partnerships are important and the government of Antigua and Barbuda has become a huge partner for Cricket West Indies to the point that during the pandemic, both Cricket West Indies and the Antigua and Barbuda government was able to open back up cricket to the region. First, you started with the women's camp under a new coach, so Courtney Walsh. Then you had the Leeward Islands Hurricane Camp. And then you had the CG Super 50 Insurance Competition. We had all of the six territories coming to Antigua and Barbuda. And then you also had the Sri Lanka Test Series. And then we've had the Pakistan Women's Series. And now we have also got the South Africa women's series, and then we had the CG, CG, Rising Stars, as we would say, under 19 cricketers in Antigua and Barbuda training. They are in England now, they've arrived safely and sound. But the partnership between the government of Antigua and Barbuda and Cricket West Indies has earmarked a new venue, the home for Cricket West Indies, your high performance center, the Coolidge Cricket Ground. Um, talk to us a little bit about some of the plans for the high performance center at the Coolidge Cricket Ground and the investment that will be made over that period of time. Yeah, look, we enjoy um, enormous support um, from the Antigua and Barbuda government, as we do uh, all the, the governments of the region. You know, most of the international ICC accredited stadiums in the region are owned and um, managed by the governments. Um, and and that, that requires, obviously, not just a big initial investment, uh, that dates back predominantly to the 2007 Cricket World Cup that was hosted in the in the West Indies, um, but also the ongoing maintenance of those facilities. So here in Antigua, we've, in partnership with the government, um, we've acquired the old Stanford Cricket Ground um, near the airport in the Coolidge um, region of, of the country. Um, that's a sort of 20-acre site that involves um, an internationally accredited um, ground and oval. Uh, with a number of wickets in the centre, but also side wickets for nets, uh, as well as a practice facility behind the ground. Um, it has a pavilion, it's sort of 7,000 um, capacity um, stadium with full flood lights, and um, it's got an athletics club, a large car park, and uh, and the old sticky wicket restaurant building that 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 is adjacent to the pitch. So we we've bought that with a with very ambitious plans to develop it from a cricketing perspective. Um, into our high performance center to and so to enhance all the cricket facilities from playing surfaces to dressing dressing room facilities to indoor indoor nets um, to um, physiotherapy and rehab center to high performance gym um, so we've got very ambitious plans from that perspective but also then in order to fund that we've got a number of commercial activities that we're looking to establish or enhance at the ground um, which will require uh, significant investment over the next five to ten years. But it's something that we're committed to do. We want to have a base within the region that is genuinely world class, um, not just serving West Indies cricket, but also acting as a hub for the entire um, Americas region, which is you know, we're the only full member in the Americas. And we take that responsibility 
uh, seriously. And therefore, if we can develop a world class training and professional high performance centre here in Antigua, we can utilise it for all of our West Indies teams, but also uh, work with our um, friends within the ICC Americas to make sure that they also have access, not just the best facilities, but uh, the best people um, that can enhance their own high performance um, programs. And, and also from a education and training perspective and development point of view, you know, work with coaches and umpires and, and scorers and the other key people that you need to operate cricket uh, and use that as a finishing school for them too. So, um, yeah, look, at the moment, hosting cricket is enormously challenging anywhere in the world, but particularly in the Caribbean, whilst we have very low COVID numbers in comparison to many other places in the world. Um, you know, the the ability to bring people in, um, the disruptive flight schedules, the changing quarantine um, situations that, that we faced, Antigua has become, you know, a, a prime hub for us to be able to host all the cricket. So, yeah, you're right. We've we've welcomed Sri Lanka for all three forms of the game back in March. We've had Pakistan, not just from a women's perspective, but also from an A team, a women's A team perspective. The first time we've had a, a women's A team series ever. Uh, we've also now, as you say, South Africa arrived uh, on Tuesday of last week. South Africa women to play our West Indies women's team, and yeah, we've had the under 19s here for a month. 60 of them going through trial games. Um, and, and 18 of them have just, as you said, just arrived safely in England for, a, for, a, for an ODI tour there. Um, and we've had some regional cricket and, and, and high performance camps too. So, um, yeah, the governments of the region um, that have hosted cricket, particularly, I guess, Shilak, St. Lucia um, and Grenada that came very last minute where we were very much focused on hosting South Africa men in Trinidad and Tobago, but had to move it at the last minute. The governments have been brilliant working with us going through all the medical protocols that we need to in an enormous testing program to make sure that not only we are uh, COVID free from a host country point of view, but then as we move forward, forward and through the tour that we remain COVID free. We, we've you know, done thousands of PCR tests since we returned to cricket in January here in the Caribbean and, and continue to do so. And obviously we've now got the second time during the pandemic, the CPL is taking place. It, it obviously uh, took place in Trinidad and Tobago in 2020, and uh, now it's in St Kitts and Nevis. Um, and we're, you know, just delighted that we'll be able to get some cricket on, so our players can stay active and continue to ply their trades. and And we hope and provide really good opportunities to entertain the cricket fans of the region as well as throughout the world. So it's um, it's been a particularly busy summer we've hosted four international teams from a men's perspective which is more than we would normally host uh, with sri lanka south africa australia and pakistan and um yeah it's, it's been a, a busy time despite all the challenges of covid when your body is challenged it burns fuel and energy respond to every challenge with altitude sports drink it replenishes restores and prepares you for the next level Altitude is uniquely formulated with an electrolyte blend and magnesium available in fruit punch, blue frost, and grape. Altitude. Raise your game. Gem Sports is an innovative sports equipment manufacturer specialising in the production of high quality sports nets and cages for clubs, universities and schools. The development of a Dem Sports concertina cage, either as a single or double width sports net, has helped schools in inner city areas where space is a premium to include sports such as cricket and tennis in the curriculum in a safe and enjoyable way. The nets were developed really for when we had schools with a problem space so it could be used in limited areas it folds back to the wall to a minimum of 550 millimeters and pulls out to eight meters just over this sort of equipment is exactly the solution that, that, that many head teachers will will look to use um, it is space saving it is easy to operate it is relatively low cost um, and again the impact of having provision within the school grounds 
is a, a real plus point. M Sports are the world leaders in sports nets for schools. They have a range of net sizes to suit all spaces and can custom build whatever you require. For more information on how we can help you transform your play space at school safely, quickly and affordably, contact Dem Sports for details. I think we have to really give major credit, as you rightly said, Johnny, to the governments of Jamaica and St. Lucia. Um, right now, the CPL in St. Kitts and Nevis, um, Guyana, um, you know, they, they themselves were maybe even hampered with the, with the weather, but it shows that, you know, things are happening. What is going to be happening, Johnny, for the remainder of the year in terms of the cricketing aspect? And before we start thinking maybe even about the England tour, because that in itself is going to be a huge tour, What's going to be happening for the remainder of the year? And how will countries, are countries allowed to bid for the England tour? And has those venues been decided and yet if that process has gone through? Yeah, well, firstly, from an under-19s perspective, you know, they're, they're just, as you said, um, landed in the UK. We've got um, playing just one day cricket there, which is the format for the under-19 Cricket World Cup. So 50 over cricket in England. Uh, those players will come back into the region and go home uh, and um, we'll be working with local coaches. Uh, we're hoping to host the Tri-Series um, in December with South Africa and hopefully India. And that will be the major preparation ahead of the Under-19 Cricket World Cup, which for, for West Indies cricket is really exciting. It's another global event that we're hosting uh, on the back of the 2018 uh, T20 Women's World Cup that we hosted here. So we're hosting... Um, the Under-19 Cricket World Cup in the Caribbean in January. Um, the ICC inspection team actually arrived into Antigua yesterday and they're travelling to St Kitts tomorrow, down to Guyana, uh, Trinidad and, and here in Antigua and Barbuda to do the final inspections before we announce the host countries for that uh, tournament, which will be you know, brilliant to get some of our young cricketers playing international cricket again because um, the youth programmes throughout the world, COVID's really hit them very hard. So... Hopefully, this generation of, of young cricketers will still get the opportunity to play in a, in a, in a World Cup. Uh, for the women's perspective, we've playing South Africa now, three T20s next week in Antigua, followed by five one-day internationals. Uh, we then uh, got to go to the World Cup qualifiers, which have been confirmed to be in Zimbabwe in the middle of November. So we're, we're looking to have a camp here in Antigua before heading out. We hope to play Pakistan uh, in three ODIs as part of some additional preparation of those all important World Cup qualifiers. And then should we be successful, we'll be heading to New Zealand for the Cricket World Cup uh, in February, March uh, and early April next year. So um, we'll probably go on tour in January um, as part of the preparation of that event. And that's the 50 over Women's World Cup. So the women's team are going to be very busy from now onwards um, preparing for that with a real focus on 50 over cricket. Uh, and men's wise, the end of the CPL, some players will go over to the UAE for the IPL. Uh, then the remaining of our World Cup squad will, will join them in the UAE. And we've got the T20 World Cup, which obviously we're defending world champions. So uh, really looking forward to that and hoping that the team can win a record third uh, T20 title. Um, after that, we've got some test cricket. We're going to go to Sri Lanka for the World Test Championship test series against Sri Lanka, uh, which is two test matches. And then we're, we're over to Pakistan for three T20s and three ODIs. The ODIs being part of the uh, Super League, which is the qualification league for the next 50 over World Cup that's due to take place in India in 2023. So a uh, busy time for the men. And then looking ahead into the new year, as you say, we've got Cricket Ireland coming again for some Super League fixtures as well as some T20s. And then we've got um, two visits by England. Firstly, at the end of January, we've got the T20 side coming out for five T20s. And then the big test series, the first ever uh, Richards Botham Trophy here in the Caribbean, which will be three test matches in March. So we, we're still going through the final hurdles of the bidding process. So we hope to announce the venues in the next 
couple of weeks. But um, we're also hoping that with the Caribbean, many islands being on the green list for the UK and the vaccination does it, that the um, the government supported by CARFA are rolling out throughout the region, we hope that the Caribbean will remain on the green list, will remain open to tourists, and that we hope that English fans who haven't travelled really for any major sporting event since COVID started uh, will flock to the Caribbean in big numbers to support England. And we hope to repeat what we did in 2019, which is to, to win the, the series here in the Caribbean and to, to get all important World Test Championship points. And um, yeah, so it's going to be a, a really busy period between now and, and March for both the men's, women's um, and the under-19s team. And um, yeah, hopefully we can provide some really good entertainment. And um, as I know, all the fans of West Indies cricket will want, which will be to consistently win in all those different formats with all those different teams. Now, I know someone is going to ask me on OnDrive, what is going to be happening with West Indies cricket? Will the four-day competition come back on stream or a decision will be made in terms of what is going to be happening with all this international cricket coming? Because we have the ICC under 19, then you have England, and then we still have to try to be able to provide opportunities for the franchises. Yeah, well, we've still got 90 franchise players under under annual contracts, and um, they've been working with their franchises to be as active as they can. There's been some T10 cricket that's been played throughout the region, some T20 cricket, and also some three- and four-day cricket that's been played. Clearly, we had, as you said earlier, Vernon, we had the CG Insurance Super 50 Cup, our 50-over competition in February of last year. And so Jimmy Adams and the team are really focused on trying to get some four-day Red Bull cricket for our regional players because they haven't played any since March um, 2020 when the pandemic began. So um, real focus on regional cricket, but again, the 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 inter-island um, travel at the moment is, as you know, Vernon, but fans may not know outside of the region is highly disruptive. Uh, what used to be regular flight routes island to, to Ireland have been very much challenged. Trinidad and Tobago now have their borders open, which is a big help to us previously. So a few weeks ago, we were having to private charter planes out of Trinidad and, and to repatriate planes back to Trinidad using private planes. So enormously expensive. Um, We've also taken a real lead in making sure that as many of our players and support staff, as well as stadium staff that are crucial to operating cricket, get fully vaccinated. Uh, we've been big advocates of that. and We've encouraged people in the region to take their vaccinations. So uh, the vast majority now of our women's team on and off the field, um, our men's team, and uh, as of Friday, we were supported by the Antigua government able to get 15 of our under-19 squad uh, with their first dose of the Pfizer vaccine. So um, we're making good progress to try and get everyone fully vaccinated. If we can do that, then hopefully uh, we'll be able to move a bit more freely around the Caribbean just with testing and um, hopefully no quarantines. Um, subject to how those flight schedules work, we're hoping that we'll be able to get a four-day regional cricket on early in 2022 which will provide really good preparation for our Red Bull cricketers after that series against Sri Lanka in, in November and early December, uh, preparing for that big visit of England in March. So that's really the focus. And then we're hoping that um, we can we can start to contemplate those youth tournaments that we would have had pre-COVID, both under-19s, boys and girls, under-17 boys and under-15 boys. Uh, we really want to get those youth tournaments back up and running as well. So... Um, clearly, we're all being led by um, the governments and ministries of health in terms of what's um, feasible and possible and safe. And uh, as we've always said, we'll play as much cricket as we possibly can. Uh, but this sort of health and safety of our players and staff, as well as the health and safety of the populations of the host countries, is always the number one priority. So we're very much led by uh, the, the, the health authorities as to what we can do and, and how we can mitigate and manage the risk. If you're wondering what's happening on OnDrive, we're speaking to the Chief Executive Officer of Cricket West Indies, and I'm alongside my co-host, Calvin Blancandal. Calvin, your thoughts? Um, anything that you want to ask Johnny? Be, you know, as, because I've got a couple more questions that I'll be quizzing at him, but I know you'll be buzzing with excitement based on the information that you'll have heard so far. And to all our viewers and listeners, this is what the platform OnDrive 
will produce going forward. Yes, very excited about what's happening with West Indies cricket. I see that CEO Grave is a very busy man managing many tours and other competitions. So I'm going to go right to the business of sports. The spectators want to see wins, but they sometimes forget that the sport has to be financed. How important is the commercialization of West Indies cricket outside of the region? Yeah, look, at the moment, as, as I said right at the top of, of the show, the um, one of the unique things about West Indies cricket is it's not funded by uh, a major host uh, broadcaster. So um, that means that we rely predominantly on overseas broadcast money, um, makes up about 80% of our commercial revenue and our commercial revenue makes up about 40% of the total. So uh, we, we're obviously a full member of the ICC and we're funded by the ICC. And that ICC funding makes up again about another 40% of our revenue. So overseas TV money in particular uh, is enormously important to our financial health. Um, and um, yeah, really when we're talking about that, we're talking about inbound tours by England, inbound tours by India the two biggest TV markets for most international teams, but particularly the West Indies with that lack of a real domestic broadcaster that, that funds the game. So uh, 2022, therefore, um, is a massive year for us. It's um, hopefully a year that we're coming out of some of the restrictions and challenges and costs of operating under COVID. Hopefully it's an opportunity where we can safely get our fans back into the stadiums to to watch and, and support and rally around the teams. Um, and hopefully as well, it's it's um, going to involve, uh, as I said, a two format visit by England and T20s and tests. And then later in the year in August, we're uh, looking to host India. Um, so the two biggest teams from a touring point of view, from a TV perspective, uh, will both visit the Caribbean, we hope in 2022. So um, they, they, they are absolutely crucial to our financial health um, and we're also making and have made a uh, huge changes to how we operate um, from a financial and operations perspective we've really embraced technology over the over the covid period and um, we'll certainly be much more efficient in terms of how we manage our finances and and how our finance department function that will hopefully mean that as money and more money comes in we can make sure that we're spending it uh, as efficiently as we possibly can be to make sure that we're balancing the books. When your body is challenged, it burns fuel and energy. Respond to every challenge with Altitude Sports Drink. It replenishes, restores, and prepares you for the next level. Altitude is uniquely formulated with an electrolyte blend and magnesium available in fruit punch, blue frost, and grape. Altitude. Raise your game. Dem Sports is an innovative sports equipment manufacturer specializing in the production of high quality sports nets and cages for clubs universities and schools. The development of a Den Sports concertina cage, either as a single or double width sports net, has helped schools in inner city areas where space is a premium to include sports such as cricket and tennis in the curriculum in a safe and enjoyable way. The nets were developed really for when we had schools with a problem in space so it could be used in limited areas. It folds back to the wall to a minimum of 550 millimetres and pulls out to eight meters just over. This sort of equipment is exactly the solution that, that, that many head teachers will, will look to use. Um, it is space saving, it is easy to operate, it is relatively low cost um, and again the impact of having provision within the school grounds is a, a real plus point. Them sports are the world leaders in sports nets for schools. They have a range of net sizes to suit all spaces and can custom build whatever you require. For more information on how we can help you transform your play space at school safely, quickly and affordably, contact Dem Sports for details.
Yes. Now, at the onset of the pandemic, the West Indies traveled to the UK to play England. How important was that tour for England? But more importantly, how important was that tour for the West Indies? Well, it was important for a number of pers per sort of perspectives, I think. Firstly, we were the first teams in England and the West Indies to return to play international cricket after the onset of the pandemic. And it was the first real test of what was a concept um, between the, the medical teams of creating a biosecure environment. Um, so clearly the venues in England where you've got um, the Aegeus Bowl in, in Hampshire and um, Emirates Old Trafford in Manchester, that the actually have hotels that are part of the cricket ground um, with rooms overlooking the ground gave us this unique opportunity to create a, a very, very tight bubble where the players um, arrived on a private plane into the private terminal at Manchester Airport that wasn't being used. They were immediately transferred to the cricket ground and they lived, stayed and worked from that cricket ground throughout the tour. The only time they left was to go down to re-establish the bubble in Southampton and then back to Manchester before departing. And what that gave was um, the first real concrete test of could with a robust testing program and, and, and protocols in place, could we get live cricket back on? And, and that was enormously important, not just to England and, and West Indies, but to all cricket teams and, and actually other sporting teams that were looking at us as to how we could possibly do it. Obviously, we replicated that in Trinidad and Tobago with the CPL played um, in Trinidad, but with the difference being we were at two venues in the Brian Lara Academy and the, the Queen's Park Oval in Port of Spain and that we had a bubble at the Hilton in Port of Spain. So that's when the bubble sort of idea and concept started to move away from one fixed location where you had everything you'd need within the ground, hotel, accommodation, everything, to, to more of a sort of, a sort of a stretch by a bubble where you would have the accommodation and then also the cricket venues. Um, so that, that's been a, a very successful model, very difficult to manage, and our cricket operations team and medical team have done wonders working with the governments to play as much cricket across the Caribbean using that concept. Um, and really, that's been the lifeblood to all cricket boards. It's been, uh, it's enabled us to continue to receive money from TV companies and from sponsors. Um, and with that money, we've been able to keep our organisations afloat. So um, clearly, the England tour was hugely important for England because it was their home tour. So they keep all the money from those home series. And that allowed them to receive money under their new broadcasting agreement with Sky and, and then obviously give confidence to Pakistan and to Australia and to Crooked Island to, to follow us. Uh, it was a segue for us also to be able to take our West Indies women's team over to England to be the first women's team to play cricket under the pandemic. Um, and we were very grateful for the invitation that the ECB gave us. And then on the back of all of that, our relationship with England has improved enormously. We've got England are coming here in 2022, as I said, but for more games, we've got two additional T20s and a test match, which will further boost our coffers from a commercial perspective. But also for the governments of the region, there's more England fans hopefully travelling, more matches for them to attend. So hopefully it will be a boost, not just commercially for West Indies cricket, but also for the Caribbean as a whole, um, which is obviously uh, well needed because tourism, which most of the countries rely on as a, as a key revenue and employment sector, uh, has been significantly hampered um, since the pandemic. So, yeah, the England tour, as you say, was the real catalyst to all of this that's happened and transpired since and was therefore, um, you know, a very, very significant moment. And, you know, for our players who were really leaving the Caribbean, which was at the time COVID-free, to travel to England, which was experiencing high numbers of COVID and there was still lots of unknown about the disease and the pandemic at that stage, you know, it was an amazing um, sort of commitment to cricket, not just West Indies cricket, but global cricket for our players to, to go over and to be the first team to do it, uh, followed by a women's team that were first to do it. I think that, that took enormous, enormous courage and, um, yeah, we're very, very grateful to our players for doing so. And, uh, yeah, we obviously won the first Test match and we're looking forward to a, a series win. England obviously fought back and we lost the series, but it was still great to... I think for everyone to be watching Test cricket again, and um, and gave everyone hope that we could, you know, return to some sort of degree of normality uh, despite all the challenges that we were facing. Okay, I have one more question before I hand it over to Mr. Springer. 
Your relationship with the Americas, I'm from Bermuda. We went to the World Cup once in 2007, you know, the smallest nation or island to ever do so. So very proud of that. Um, but what can the countries in the Americas do to strengthen the relationship with the West Indies Cricket Board? And what can the West Indies Cricket Board do to strengthen the relationship with the smaller competing countries who are trying to develop cricket in their region? Yeah, look, I think, um, you know, the, the cricket in this part of the world is um, is developing and there are some fantastic success stories, both in the men's and women's games across the Americas. And um, certainly the ICC have, have called out uh, growth as one of their key strategic drivers, which for the real first time, I think there's going to be more support from the ICC and more focus on how we can grow, not just within the full members, but in the associate nations. Uh, we're certainly talking and working much more closely with the ICC Americas than than we've done so beforehand. And we've 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 developed under uh, our coach education manager Chris Brabison a, a, a new West Indies accreditation program of coaching from foundation all the way up now to what will be in October and November our first ever cricket West Indies owned coaching level three course, as well as a curator course that Ken Craft and our regional curator develops and Peter Nero, our regional umpire trainer, who's been traveling around, not just the Caribbean, but actually uh, he was recently in Belize and other places within the Americas uh, providing umpire training. So we very much hope that our coach and development team can work very closely with our friends in the ICC Americas region. Uh, we've been working with ICC to roll out our coaching programs throughout the world for associate nations. I think that's gonna be a fantastic initiative not just for the associates within the Americas, but all around the world to, to be using the majority of our knowledge and IP around coaching um, to, to have their own programs that hopefully again, particularly from an America's point of view, won't be just in, in the English language, will also be in the Spanish language, which will help the development, particularly in, in the Spanish speaking parts of South America and Latin America and the Caribbean. So, um, yeah, we're, we're excited by the opportunities. We're talking about how Antigua can play more of a host, not just for those development opportunities, but also from a cricketing perspective. And ho hopefully we might well be hosting and, and some, some of the, the ICC Americas qualifiers for some of the upcoming global um, events as well. So, yeah, I think it's, it's work in progress. We're certainly open to the partnerships and, um, yeah, hopefully we can continue to work together despite all the challenges in the Americas of, you know, significantly large geographical area. I'm one of the smaller full members in terms of financial resources with Cricket West Indies. But but as I say, it's, it's great to see the ICC put more of a focus on growth and participation. Uh, and together with the USA, we're hoping to bring one of those iconic men's uh, international global events to the Americas within the next cycle, uh, which I think will be an enormous opportunity for everyone to get behind um, an ICC global event and, and for it to be a real boost to the region. Perfect. Back to you, Ronan. Johnny, the regional women's competition had to be postponed in Guyana because the pandemic would have hit us, hit us very, very, very hard. Explain a little bit about the women's contracted players and the decision of the Barbados team who will be going to the Commonwealth Games? Yes, we've got 18 players under central contract who, as you said, since January have been predominantly based in Antigua, working under head coach Courtney Walsh. Uh, they had a camp in, in, in January and in the early part of February. Uh, they then went home briefly. Um, obviously, they had the tour last uh, September uh, to the UK. Uh, we then brought them back into camp here after Easter uh, and then welcome Pakistan women and, and their A team to play uh, a wider pool of players. So we had uh, 30 players here from May. Um, so an emerging players group, as well as the established players playing and, and training and working together. Um, they've now been back here since August. A number of our three biggest players went over to the 100 ball competition in the UK to play there and, and did well and were successful. Um, so we're looking forward to playing South Africa. Um, that series was delayed a little bit. Um, obviously, the travel routes from South Africa to the Caribbean have been massively disrupted and also South Africa on the red list of a number of countries. So 
slightly delayed in coming here. The ICC have then brought forward the World Cup qualifiers. So instead of being in December, they now start in November. And our plan was always to play about three additional one-day internationals in advance of that tournament as further preparation. And we've almost confirmed that with Pakistan. So with the South Africa series going later into September, with the preparation for both the World Cup uh, in terms of camps and, and playing um, Pakistan before the World Cup qualifiers in Zimbabwe, the window to have a women's regional just got smaller and smaller. And with quarantines and challenges, both in terms of entering countries, but also on the return and the vaccination status of our women's players at regional level, uh, not all being fully vaccinated meant that the, the whole group would have been deemed unvaccinated. So it became very challenging for us logistically, medically, and from a cost perspective to, to host the women's regionals. So uh, the Commonwealth Games takes place in Birmingham in August next year in 2022. And that Commonwealth Games is going to have women's T20 cricket in it, which is fantastic. And because of our world ranking position, West Indies qualified for that. And then obviously we agreed with the Commonwealth Games and ICC that the leading team in the Caribbean would represent us at the Commonwealth Games. And because of the fact that we couldn't hold our regional competition, Barbados, who won it when it was last played in 2019, they also won the T20 in 2018. Uh, will go through as our representative. So the Barbados women's team will, in a sense, represent West Indies at the Commonwealth Games. Uh, and, um, you know, whilst it's disappointing for everyone that we weren't able to host the women's regional competition, the real main drive and focus in the short term with all the challenges is to make sure that we qualify for that Women's World Cup in New Zealand next year. And therefore, how we plan and prepare for the the qualifiers in Zimbabwe was the absolute number one priority. And unfortunately, at the moment with COVID, we're having to make difficult decisions and choices. And, and that was one that we had to do reluctantly. We had to cancel the Women's Regional um, for this year. But we're obviously desperately hope that we can have it next year and that the Women's Regional players underneath the international players will have a really good preparation leading into those uh, matches. And then we can have a very exciting women's regional tournament in both 20 over and 50 over cricket, which will give our women's selection panel, which is now a separate selection panel, an opportunity to look at the best 90 or so women's players in the region and start to identify some of the new talent that's coming through to put some pressure on uh, that women's team. And, and clearly having an emerging players team play against Pakistan in July, we're hoping that we'll be able to continue with that concept and host and travel with a, an A-team at women's level um, to try and give opportunities to that next generation of, of women's players to, to, to show and demonstrate that they've got what it takes to become a successful international player. When your body is challenged, it burns fuel and energy. Respond to every challenge with Altitude Sports Drink. It replenishes, restores, and prepares you for the next level. Altitude is uniquely formulated with an electrolyte blend and magnesium available in fruit punch, blue frost, and grape. Altitude. Raise your game. Dem Sports is an innovative sports equipment manufacturer specialising in the production of high quality sports nets and cages for clubs, universities and schools. The development of a Dem Sports concertina cage, either as a single or double width sports net, has helped schools in inner city areas where space is a premium to include sports such as cricket and tennis in the curriculum in a safe and enjoyable way. The nets were developed really for when we had schools with a problem space so it could be used in limited areas. It folds back to the wall to a minimum of 515 millimetres and pulls out to 8 metres just over. This sort of equipment is exactly the solution that, that, that many head teachers will, will look to use. Um, it is space saving, it is easy to operate, it is relatively low cost um, and again the impact of having provision within the school grounds is a, a real plus point. Dem Sports are the world leaders in sports nets for schools. They have a range of net sizes to suit all spaces 
and can custom build whatever you require. For more information on how we can help you transform your play space at school safely, quickly and affordably, contact Dem Sports for details. talking about players and so it is always very important to make sure that we have a collaboration and a conversation with the West Indies Players Association and that under your tenure has improved. Are you satisfied with the relationship between the West Indies Players Association and Cricket West Indies as we look to advance cricketers in the region? Yeah look I've always said that stakeholder relations are absolutely key to us you know we can't operate and run and manage West Indies cricket on our own. We need uh, to strengthen our government relations. And one of the things that COVID's done is, is put us much more uh, in, in, in partnership with and in dialogue with uh, the ministries of sport and health um, over this sort of COVID time. And we can't do anything without the government. So it's, it's been brilliant. I think one of the positives of COVID has been that our government relations have become much, much stronger. And we've spoken to them on a much more regular basis throughout the region. Uh, I think our relationship with the West Indies Players Association is good. It, you know, any relationship could always be better, and we're certainly striving to improve relations and and to improve the partnership. I think we've made massive strides with our relationship with the Caribbean Premier League, and and again, I think there's opportunities to do do more and improve our relationship, not just with the CPL, but also those six franchise owners. Um, and we've improved, I think, our relationship with Wikio, the Umpires Association, and. And again, we'll be looking to strengthen that as well as, you know, our relationship with the private sector in the Caribbean, because we need more sponsors uh, at all level, uh, not just at West Indies cricket, but our franchises need corporate support as well as local clubs and, and grassroots initiatives. So uh, it's something that we're, we're very focused on and um, you can always do more. But I think we're satisfied with 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 where we are at the moment, but we're, we're very ambitious and we want uh, to improve our relationships, not just with the Players Association, but with all stakeholders in the region. Somebody has just nudged me and they want to know if opportunities will be provided for new match referees in the Caribbean. Yeah, as I said, we're always looking to um, improve opportunities for our umpires. Again, one of the things with COVID is we've had um, you know, all, all West Indian uh, match officials and that continues at the moment. So we've got... Um, all West Indies match officials, including match referees, um, in SIG kits for the CPL. We've also got um, those on our senior panel that aren't working in SIG kits are here in Antigua working on that South Africa series. And um, yeah, I think it's provided you know great opportunities for our senior panel and therefore um, you know, what it will do as well is, is hopefully allow us to continue to invest and work with Wikia to, to and Peter Nero, who's predominantly leads on all our training and education, to continue to try and get more people officiating the game. You know, we, we you can't have a cricket match with just players. You need ground staff, you need match officials, you need scorers, and these are, you know, really important people. And we need to continue to give opportunities, not just for training, but also then opportunities to actually get out in the middle and, and perform. So, yeah, it's something we're very focused on. Johnny? The Caribbean Premier League, the Hero Caribbean Premier League, started in 2013, came long before your time. There was an arrangement made with the then West Indies Cricket Board. There are some pundits around the Caribbean who feel that, you know, Cricket West Indies should have their own T20 tournament. But really, as you were talking about the finances and the window available, that's maybe not going to be any time soon possible. How has the relationship improved with the CPL and Cricket West Indies on your, under your tenure? Well, I think we've made um, real strides. We certainly have very open dialogue. We, I speak to the CPL, obviously, at the moment, almost on a, a daily basis because of the tournament taking place. But what I would say is at the moment, from a men's perspective, um, our international men's team across the three different formats pretty much play non-stop cricket. 
Um, if you're an all format player like a Jason Holder, uh, there's no real break. You know, they play obviously the CPL, Jason's playing the IPL as well, which means all year round he's playing cricket. So actually, you know, to have more tournaments or more events would be very difficult because at the moment we're having to manage workloads and rest players probably more than we've we've had to in the past. Um, I think in terms of the CPL, some of the initiatives that we're really proud of and that we, we've made a start on, I wouldn't say that we've got them to the level that any of us want because we are ambitious and we want to strengthen and improve on everything we do year on year. But you know, to have the emerging players now mandated that two uh, young cricketers under 23 must be in every CPL squad and and one of them must play a minimum of, of five matches so they get guaranteed on-field um, opportunity, not just making up those squads, I think is great. Uh, we've really put a West Indies first philosophy behind the CPL and have worked and encouraged the franchise to do so. And we've got many more West Indian uh, working on the CPL, not just in, in those franchise teams and support staff, but the medical teams, uh, the TV crew, camera crew, commentary crew and operation staff. So we've got many more opportunities for West Indians to work and get experience on CPL. Uh, we've also aligned our fitness and conditioning policies. So we're trying to drive consistent fitness standards across all of our cricket and the CPL have been very supportive of that. And we're also discussing ways in which we can improve the tournament. We had women's exhibition games in the T10 version um, as trial matches. Uh, and they were successful and we're looking to build on those. Um, so, yeah, the, I think, um, yeah, we've made some improvements. We now make all the match official app appointments for CPL. So we've got our elite senior umpires uh, and match officials working on the CPL. There's no overseas umpires uh, in the league for the last two years. And again, so we're taking much greater ownership of the things that people would expect us to from a, a governing body perspective. We're also working with them commercially and 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 from a cricket first perspective to make sure that the tournament is our number one domestic t20 tournament it's our official one now we need to make sure it's producing the best t20 cricketers that we can do it's unearthing new talent um on and off the field and um yeah hopefully as you can imagine this year it takes on added importance as it's you know it's a real opportunity as part of our preparation for uh, the T20 World Cup are defending uh, the title. So CPL is very, very important to us and, and we're certainly working with them and view them as a as a major, major partner and stakeholder within the game. Now, Cricket West Indies don't own any venues and so it is important to partner with the governments who own the venues. The normal man on the road sometimes don't understand that and so you hear folks have been saying that uh, days of old we know that when we went to sabina park we'll get a fast track or we went to kensington oval we'll get a, a a pretty massive you know pace attack we go to trinidad and tobago you'll be spin we go to Ghana, you will be spin but all those things have changed do you have full control in terms of cricket west indies determining and i'm talking now on behalf of maybe phil simmons who is the head coach of the of the west indies senior test team where he can be able to say, listen, if I'm coming to the celebrated stadium at in Antigua, I want a spinner's track or I want a fast track. Is, is that mandated with Cricket West Indies and the owners of the venues, the curators around the Caribbean? Yeah, well, look, firstly, the ICC have put a real emphasis on um, producing the best possible playing services they can. And there are very stern demerit points that the match referees can give out if they believe the pitches are of poor quality or inconsistent in terms of their bounce and carry or they take too much seam or or spin too early on in the game um so firstly all of them are, are, are rated by the match officials and then those, those demerit points would come in and if you get too many demerit points your international status as a venue is suspended uh, so fairly um, serious ramifications if we produce uh, inferior or, or poor pitches um Clearly, from a playing point of view, Jimmy Adams demands not just our, our match um, our match surfaces, but also the practice wickets that we want to be playing in the best possible cricket wickets and training on them to, to allow our players to develop their skills um, at the highest level. So um, we've had a big focus on 
improving the services. Kent Crafton is our regional curator, so he will visit every international ground prior to an international taking place. He'll work with the head curator of the ground to oversee the management of those wickets and playing surfaces. Um, but it's not an exact science, as, as everyone knows. Um, you know, I would never criticise any of those curators because they've been, you know, in lockdown. Um, they've had reduced hours and, and restrictions in place. We, in the case of St Lucia and Grenada, we were expecting to be in Trinidad up until about four weeks before hosting South Africa. So they suddenly on the hoof had to get everything ready and prepare for international cricket and not just one match. You know, we held a, um, a three-day game, a four-day game and two test matches um, at the Darren Sammy Stadium. And then after a short pause, we were back there for five T20 internationals. So a huge amount of cricket for one venue at last minute to prepare the surfaces. I thought they did a brilliant job. Grenada obviously hosted the T20s as well with, with short notice because, again, they were going to be hosted in Trinidad right up to the 11th hour. And then Barbados had unique challenges with the volcanic ash that descended on them from St. Vincent, uh, as well as COVID restrictions in terms of curfews and uh, and timing restrictions that they had. Guyana, as you mentioned, Vernon had, um, you know, an unprecedented amount of, of rain and water in the build-up to the game. So again, that that further complicated their ability to to prepare as much as they would have done. And similarly in Sabina, Jamaica went into lockdowns. Um, in, in terms of curfews and stuff and the build-up to those matches. So it's never easy preparing pitches at any, any time with uncertainty of weather and, and other challenges that you get. But particularly in COVID, uh, when you're not getting as much notice as you would perhaps normally get in the build-up to those games, uh, as well as those other challenges that they face. So, um, yes, we take it very seriously. We're investing in, in, our, in our pitches and outfields. We have seen improvements in terms of our ICC ratings going back since 2017 uh, and we continue to put an enormous focus on those and, and again hopefully now with the philosophy of taking international cricket around the region giving every international venue um, at least two white ball games or, or a test match from a men's perspective and then sharing the women's games around the region as well hopefully each international cricket stadium in the Caribbean is going to get regular cricket uh, which means they can you know keep um, those standards and, and the quality of the playing surface is very, very high. I'm just going to take you onto the balcony and maybe just ask you a little bit. I know you're supporting an English Premier League football team. So, which is your team? Yes, Vernon. Um, my team is uh, currently, if we can turn the Premier League table upside down, then I'd be a happy man. Um, my team is, I follow the greatest football team in the world. Um, we play in red, um, we're based in London, but uh, are currently giving everyone else a bit of a bit of a head start. So we're yet to get off the mark, um, uh, Arsenal Football Club. Yeah, so difficult day yesterday. Got a lot of WhatsApp messages from Man City fans, um, but it's, um, you know, we, we've never been relegated and uh, I'm sure our fortunes will uh, will improve. Calvin, who's your, who's your favourite English team? Because I'm a Manchester United fan. Well, my team plays in red, and at the moment, I'm pretty happy with the standings. We just got, some would say, the greatest player ever, or one of the greatest back footballs coming home, as they would say in the UK. So uh, Manchester United looks pretty promising this season. Ah, well, I think that is a lighter moment that we just needed to turn a cool down. Back to cricket. I just want to be able to just thank the CEO of Cricket West Indies and Cal and myself it really was indeed a pleasure on our instrumental first major interview on Drive. And we're going to provide a platform with Cricket West Indies Johnny to make sure that we'll be able to get the up-to-date information out there very quickly. And we're going to be working very closely with you over the next couple of months and next couple of years to make sure that Cricket West Indies is provided with a platform that can be able to get the message out to the entire world. It was indeed a pleasure speaking with us, our first episode on OnDrive, and we look forward in getting the message out um, to the wider part of the world. Yeah, look, thank you both for having me on, um, and I wish you uh, the best of luck in, uh, in your future endeavours on this, and I'm going to go and uh, enjoy the rest of my Sunday and watch... Um, 
Mark Overmars score a goal at Old Trafford in 1998 on YouTube and um, remember the good old days when we won the league at Old Trafford. So thank you, gentlemen. <laughs> thank you, Johnny. And uh, you. next time we speak, may we look at the table and may Arsenal be in better standings and Manchester United just be one, three points ahead of you and we'll, be, we'll remain friends. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Good luck, gents. And, and thanks once again for having me on. Thank you very much. Okay, so we could talk freely. Thank you very much, Johnny. It was a pleasure. This was the first time. It's not live, so we'll edit it. We'll include you in it so you can approve it. And uh, yeah, it's been fantastic. It's just about getting your story out to everyone that loves cricket. And in Bermuda, that are cricket mad, you know, we want to hear more about the big brother, the West Indies, going back to the Malcolm Marshall days. You have a lot of seniors that have that nostalgia. And all they want is for West Indies cricket to be in. When you win, we win. Because it's not about just the field, it's about, you know, the culture and the national pride. And, you know, most Bermudians are from Trinidad or Jamaica, Antigua, St. Kitts and Nevis, Grenada. So there is a lot of heritage between all of the islands. But but thank you. Thanks, guys. And uh, as I said, yeah, you know, best of luck and we'll hopefully speak soon. Yes. All right. Thank thanks, you, guys. God bless you, Johnny. Take care, Johnny.